Today we're talking about requirement elicitation techniques. How do you actually draw out requirements out of people, out of processes, out of documents to make sure you understand the problem and that you can meet the client's needs? How do you do that? That is what we're talking about today. So it makes no sense to skip this video or to try to rush ahead because it's all going to be good. This is the video you'll be looking for. So stay right there. I will be right back. Mm-hmm. 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 why they call it requirements elicitation and not requirements gathering. I've seen people say requirements gathering and you know I know that people just use terms without really thinking through it but requirements are not lying around for you to go gather them. They're not just sitting around for you to get them and just put them together. That's not what's going on, right? So you have to elicit, you have to draw out, you have to get to the get to the root cause. It's not very obvious. You have to ask and probe until you actually get the responses that itemize and show what the actual requirement is, right? So, I just want to say that it's not requirements gathering, it's requirements elicitation. And how do you do this? Now, there are many techniques that we can use, right? Um, and those include interviews, brainstorming, um, workshops, um, observation, you know, process modeling or business modeling, all of these are different techniques that you can use. But really, it's not so much about the technique, but more about when to use the technique. Like, when is the best time to actually use a technique to find out or to draw out requirements? It's a very, very, um, I would say, a, a very specific skill that you have to have. And this is the root. This is the, the, the root of being a business analyst. If you're not able to actually elicit requirements, then you're not worth your salt. <laughs> so it's just the truth. Like this is what makes you the better person to have on the team than just anybody, right? You could always say a developer can go write code if you know what to write. The problem is what to write. How do you know what it is? And that's where the elicitation techniques come into play. So I would say before you jump in to start, you know, applying these techniques and say, okay, I'm going to go start doing an interview, I'm going to hold a workshop, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, do all of these things to elicit requirements, the first, 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 first thing you need to do is to understand the world in which the business is living in, right? Understand the world that they live in, the users live in, that the clients live in, understand just your environment. For example, if you work at a bank, right, and you're into um, mortgage loans, right, and they say, well, we need a system that will make mortgage lending easier. They always give you these very broad um, expectations. We want it to be easier. We want it to, to, to allow us to make more money. We want to get more applications processed quicker and things like that. Before you jump into, let me do some interviews and find out this and do some workshops and do some observations and all that stuff. The first thing you need to do as a business analyst is understand that world. What exactly is it like from the processor's perspective to be processing a mortgage loan? How do I start my day? What's the next thing I do? These are what we call jobs to be done. If you understand the jobs to be done, then you can find out where the pain points are and why it is taking so long. And then you can do your interviews and you can ask more intelligent questions that bring the, the root causes of the problem to the fore. You have to, have to, have to try to understand the world of each of your stakeholders or your users and the people that benefit from whatever you're going to be improving. So if you're working on a mortgage system to make it easier and you know, process more applications quicker and all that stuff, first you identify who are the stakeholders, right? So you know that the processor is going to be involved, the underwriter is involved, the, the person buying obviously is involved, there might be third party involved. 
So you look at the world of all of these different uh, personas, we call them, and you try to understand what are they trying to do? What are their jobs? What is the job that they're trying to accomplish? So you look at the process, you look at all these different people, you understand their world a little bit more. That will give you certain background knowledge so that when you're doing the interviews and observations and stuff like that, you understand what they're doing. You understand why they're doing that. So part of it is understanding the lingo, the jargons they use, the terms they use, why they use it, what it means to them, right? Um, there is a challenge where you don't always have access to some of these people. So for example, you may have access to the buyer of the house to understand his mindset. But you can do some research, you can, you can, you know, you can see how other buyers have, or even people in your family who have bought a house, you can see how they feel about the whole process, things like that. So you can step outside of the boundaries and the four walls of your office and try to understand the experience of the people who's trying to do whatever your software is or your, your process is going to be improving. So that's the first thing I would say. Try to get in the mindset of these people. Try to understand the jobs to be done. And, and from that perspective, then you can properly apply the techniques I'm going to talk about. So interviews. Interviews is one of the best ways to, to understand exactly what these uh, SMEs or when I say SME, I mean subject matter expert or stakeholders are, are experiencing, right? So when you're doing an interview, it's best to be more listening than talking, obviously. Like you want them to tell you things. So you're gonna make sure that you manage the interview very well. You schedule it for the time you think it's gonna take. Not many hours is enough, but you schedule it to make sure you get the right person based on what you're trying to do. And when you get the person in the room, you let them talk. First, you have your questions that are gonna be probing questions. So you wanna start them off with something that they already know. So it's easy for them to start talking. Like, tell me more about your job. Tell me what, what are the things that you're trying to do. Tell me why it's a pain for you, you know. So you, you let them talk. And as they talk, you can pick up on different things that can help clarify any ambiguity, can explain what they're trying to accomplish. So that you as a business analyst, can walk away feeling like you've learned a lot from them and you've understood a lot of the pains that you're going to be attempting to solve. One of the good things you can do during the interview process is if you can have some kind of visual clue so that they can follow you so they make sure that you capture what they're talking about. So sometimes we just put up a, a note and as they're talking we kind of capture notes so they can see that what they're saying has impact and that we have actually captured it and you know it won't just be talk 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 and you lose the essence of what they said so as you're as you're interviewing people it's good to show them something so they can see the flow of what you have captured and they can correct you if you're making any mistakes interviews are again one of the best ways to, to elicit requirements because you can ask the relevant questions right it's great also to give you the background knowledge so that you understand and it's less um, I would say demanding on the interviewee because you don't want to be sending them emails back and forth and taking up all their time. If you slot some time with them, they can dedicate, they can focus on your questions without being distracted by everything else that's going on around them. So interview is probably the number one base elicit requirements. But you also have um, workshops. Now interviews are one on one. The workshop obviously is a group. So sometimes you have such a, a, a big problem that you don't just want to rely on one person's opinion. You don't want to go one by one by one by one by one asking different opinions. So you can group people who have, you know, interests and inputs into what you're trying to do into a room and just have a workshop. Obviously it takes more planning, more management skills because you gotta make sure you curb all the side conversations that don't relate to what you're trying to accomplish and make sure you, you know, you manage the group of people better. Um, make sure you have enough breaks between so they don't get like lackluster and tired and start giving you like short responses. They want to get lo as long responses as possible. So that's what you do in the workshop. Um, a part of it is that at the beginning when you're eliciting requirements, you're going to get a lot of different, different varying opinions, especially if you're doing a workshop where people may not agree. It's okay. It's okay if they don't agree. It's good to get differing opinions and then when you sit down to do your analysis of the feedback, then you can see and clarify you know with them which you know which direction to go so it's okay if people don't agree you just want to make sure that you capture all the different opinions and that feeds into your pool 
of information that will inform what you decide or what you propose to be the best solution to the problem. Another elicitation technique is observation. And this is very simple, right? You can just observe and see how people are doing things and that can lead into um, some requirements as well. So for example, if you, you work at an airline and you saw that people are joining the line, waiting a long time in line, getting up to the booth and then they have to lift up their bags and put it on the scale and then they have to take it off and change you know, what's in there because it's too, too heavy. You could just observe that. You don't need to actually go talk to them. I'm sure you know that they're frustrated <laughs> because they have to change the weight. So part of the solution, which many airlines have done, is to give you a scale and so you can just come and check on the scale without having to join the line first, you know, so you can know if your bag is overweight or not and you can make the adjustments outside of the line so you don't hold up the line while you're taking things out of your suitcase to match the weight you know, restriction. So things like that. So observation is a great way. Um, it works in some places. It doesn't work all the time. But it's always good to, to have this in your back pocket as well, you know, to observe. Another way to elicit requirements is through business modeling. So you've this is probably in conjunction with interviews and so on. You could have understood just the world, but it's great to kind of put those on pic in picture format. Say, okay, this process leads to this, and then this leads to this. So I'm talking about your flow chart diagrams, your UML diagrams. It's just a way for you to graphically represent what you understand about the process. And by doing that, you may reveal things that you wouldn't have otherwise seen. So for example, if you're at a decision point and it's like, if it's true, then there's this process. What if it's not true? Like, what do we do now? So that would reveal that, hey, there's a requirement here that if this doesn't work out, what do we do in this case? So just by modeling it out, it forces you to think through each of the steps and that can reveal requirements as well. The other thing is your process walkthrough. So this is again something you do in conjunction to an interview or a workshop where you have the SMEs, the subject matter experts in the room and you would have modeled the process already and you're saying okay this is what we've come up with and you walk it through with them. And they because they have so much knowledge they can say nope that's not where it goes, if, that's, if that doesn't happen then this is what we do and they can correct you. And so for that approach what you get is you show them something and it's easier for people to correct something they're looking at than to come up with something that's like on a black piece of paper, you know, like if you show them an empty whiteboard, it might be hard to come up with all of the, the steps, but if you show them what you've already come up with, it's easier for them to correct it and to tell you where you're going wrong and that could inform what you're missing in your requirements. The other way to do requirement solicitation could be role playing, so you may just you know, role play the client versus the, you know, the agent or something to figure out how best to interact with the, the two. So role play is not a very common one, um, but it could work for some industries. But most of the time in IT software projects and so on, there's not a lot of role playing because they kind of know the users already. But I could definitely see this uh, making sense in some other types of processes. So prototyping is another one. So prototyping is, I come up with this wireframe, this mock-up, and I say, hey, this is what we're planning on doing. And then the subject matter experts can poke holes and give their opinion if they think that the flow isn't right or the types of information that we're showing isn't right. So prototyping is a way of showing your wireframes or your mock-ups and getting feedback from the people who might be involved in it or might be using the system. So they'll tell you whether or not you're showing the right information, if that's what they want to see. They can poke holes into the flow and things like that. So this is another way that you show something and get feedback as opposed to just getting something from, you know, just fresh from the beginning. I always find that sometimes when you make a stab at it first, they can correct you much better than if they had to come up with the whole thing on their own. So you can determine which one is best based on your situation, but definitely prototyping does help you to expose requirements that you may otherwise miss. And then the other thing which is very common is also documentation. So you can get requirements just from reading the documentation. So for example, again, I like to go back to my banking example. So you work at a bank and you're doing mortgage. So in the US, there's a lot of regulations around mortgages. So if you're into mortgages, there's something called HOMDA, and that's just a long list of 
regulations as to what you can and cannot have on your application and in all these data points. So just by reading that document will give you all the requirements that you need. So you can elicit requirements just from reading the regulations and understanding what they need. So that's another way that you can elicit requirements. So requirements elicitation is no joke, right? This is the core of what you do as a business analyst because everybody could just write requirements, right? If it was easy to get. Like the developer could just go write some requirements and go build his own code. But you are there because you have the skills to know what to build. And you know what to build based on the elicitation techniques that you use to draw out the real requirements to solve the real problem so that you meet the business need. Now it's not an easy process. It's not something you're gonna just go gather. You know, there's no gathering of requirements. It's drawing it out. And uh, all of these techniques that I talked about are gonna result in a lot of data. You're gonna get a lot of data points of everybody's opinion and everybody's thoughts and all the documents and all the stuff. And then you're gonna to have to analyze all of that to say, okay, if I do this and this and this, I might meet, meet all of these needs. But I may not be able to do this while I do this. So there's a lot of thinking that goes on. And so you wanna get all these inputs into your brain so you can try to formulate and ideate, conceptualize the best solution. So you may not have a perfect solution, but you wanna make sure that you are solving for the majority of the needs that was expressed uh, during your elicitation exercises. So it all boils down to knowing when to use what technique and with whom. Um, sometimes you're able to easily access the people who have the knowledge, sometimes you're not able to, and so you have to fall back on another technique because you can't do the interview. So it's just applying yourself. Understanding your environment is the first thing. Then you look at what you have readily available to you and you go use that and then if you can't get the thing that you think would be best you do what's next you know do the next best thing again interviews is probably the best thing you can do if you already understand the world that these people live in that you're trying to solve the problem for and then you do the interviews to try to get the jobs to be done understand a little bit more of what they do and how it impacts them workshops are great process flows are great prototyping is great um, business modeling is great, observation is great, reading the documents is great. So these are all things that you can do to these requirements. Again, I hope this video was useful. If you have not yet subscribed, please subscribe. Click, it's very easy. And also check out my website, carolise.com, and check out my Facebook, facebook.com slash carolise. And I will see you guys next time in the next video. Thank you so much.